First Corinthians chapter number one. By the way, just because you wanted my call on the Super Bowl, since I called the last two right, I'm going to pick with my heart and not my head. So I'm going to pick Denver with my heart. And so for whatever that's worth, I wouldn't go out and put a lot of money on it <laughs> based on my prediction. Verse 18 of 1 Corinthians chapter 1. The word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the cleverness of the clever I will set aside. Where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For indeed, indeed, Jews ask for signs and Greeks search for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and to the Gentiles foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, not many superstars, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame things which are strong. And the base things of the world and, despite, and the despise God has chosen. so that he may nullify the things that are, so that no man may boast before God, but by his doing you are in Christ Jesus and become to us wisdom from God and righteousness, sanctification, and redemption, so that, just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord." When I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech or wisdom, proclaiming to you the testimony of God. For I am determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And may God teach us the meaning of His word newspaper and having breakfast and his wife said to him you know what special day this is don't you and he didn't but he did what you and I might do he lied he said oh yeah I know what special day this is he got in his car and he thought gosh what is today really racking his brain is it the anniversary of our first date he just couldn't get it you know you have moments like that you just can't remember those kind of occasions, it happens to all of us. Anyway, by mid-morning, he decided to send her a dozen red roses, and he put a note for our special day. Then at noontime, he couldn't remember, so he had a dress sent from her favorite store, a real nice one, along with a necklace for our special day. Then he asked his secretary, he said, look, call my wife and tell her not to prepare dinner. I'm taking her out to the finest restaurant in town to be ready when I get home. Still no clue. He got home. She was dressed in a new dress, new necklace. They went to this fine dinner. They had a wonderful dinner. And uh, then he said, "Our this special day has really been special, hasn't it? And she said, yes, this is the finest Groundhog Day I've ever had in my life. <laughs> You didn't know it was Groundhog Day, did you? 
See, some of you need to remember, but I guess if you're supposed to give a gift, it's not too late. You figure that out. Children's letters to the pastor. And here's one of them. She said, Dear Pastor, I would like to bring my dog to church on Sunday morning. She's just a mutt, but she's a good Christian dog. Love, Sissy. P.S. I would like to put more money in the offering plate, but my dad will not increase my allowance. Maybe you should preach a sermon on increasing allowance. It would help the church get more money. I love her spirit. I love her spirit. Paul wrote to the church at Corinth because he wanted that church to have its special days and to find enhancement in a very diverse world filled with difficulty. So with all that prevailing wisdom, he wants them to know how to make church become what God wanted it to be. So right out of the chute, he speaks to the critical issues. And he starts with the cross and says the world looks at the cross and sees it as a foolish thing. Not only that, the Jews, it's a stumbling block to the pious Jews because they believe that hanging on a cross is to be accursed. Deuteronomy. Jesus can't be the Messiah hanged on a cross. And secondly, the coming of the Messiah will be with grandiose signs. And Jesus came into Jerusalem before his death riding on a donkey. It did not square. It would not fit their mindset. And the cultured Greeks... They had all the answers. Plato, Socrates, Aristotle, they had a lot of answers. To them, God was apatheia, apathetic. He couldn't feel anything. Now how could the Jews, reading Isaiah 53, not have known that the Messiah was going to be a suffering servant? How could they have not known that? But the Greeks... God can't have identity with man. He's whimsical. He's very whimsical. He does as he pleases. He, he, he's in charge and to associate him with a man in incarnation just won't wash. So Paul says God chose an unexpected way to bring his message to the world through a cross and through the church. Then he starts at Verse, it says, many of you mighty, many of you noble, do you have a pedigree? Are you among the socially and culturally elite? And they were not. So Paul is saying, look, God has begun this movement from the bottom up through shepherds and not superstars in a barn, not in a palace. He started from the bottom up. That's not how we would start it, but that's what Paul is saying. God started in in a way the world would think was very foolish. So that was his word. And you know, the early critics of the Christian world, like Celsius in the second century, he had hard things to say about people who made up the church. Now, he was unaware really unaware that there was a segment of society, a wealthy segment of society responding to the cross, but he wrote that Christians are like a bunch of croaking frogs down by the pond. He said some very harsh things about people that made up the church. And Paul was saying, look, that's the way it is. And the reason that's the way it is is because it is precisely people who know they have a deep need Searching for God, that God in His love is trying to reach in this way. Let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. Isn't that the 31st verse? Let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. Um, Rudolf Bultmann, you had to plow through that theology. 
all kind of criticism about that. But look, the bottom line is Bultmann said this about the church. Well, the minute anybody who makes up the people of God has a spirit of self-assertion, the door gets slammed. Pure-hearted, he wanted, for all you might be critical of him about, he wanted you to understand authentically that the church is made up of people grasping and groping after God, wanting to learn his truth, wanting to experience his grace. So two things I want to say to you very quickly, and they are these. Nothing new. God chose the church to do his work in the world. We spend time reflecting on these facilities, what they ought to be about. This place where we come to worship God should be a place of beauty. It should honor God. All our facilities should be um, maintained properly because we know that it's a visible, a visible expression of the gathering of the people of God in quest to learn about him. Paul placed a high premium on the church. And what he said was, if you read the 12th chapter, he said, everybody has a gift. There's something you can do. Every bit of that working together results in the edification or upbuilding of the kingdom of God. Everybody has a gift. And because... Um, there are different gifts, and we're in a world of great challenges and great distraction. Sometimes that's hard. He wrote the 13th chapter. And he said, you know, it's not only not boasting about what you have. It is a heart that is honed in on the finest expressions of unconditional love. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or conceited or proud. Love does not keep a record of wrongs. Love is not happy with evil, but it's happy with the truth. He goes on to talk about love. And then, in order for things to flow well, the 14th chapter follows, and he says everything has to be done decently and in order. You've got to do it right. You've got to do it right. And he gives some warnings about the things that Corinthian church was doing that were out of order. And he said they were so out of order when people entered that place with no control over the worship, the world would think you're mad. That's what he said. The world will come in, they think you're mad. But then in the 25th verse of that chapter, and I think it's the key to that whole book, the more I think about it, he said, you conduct yourself in a spirit of praise and celebration so that the onlooking world who comes in will know God is really among you. That is the throbbing pulse beat to me of 1 Corinthians. That whatever you do as the people of God, it is so that people will know that God is really among you. And what really blows me away and humbles me is he says one of the main tools of doing that is preaching. He said it is through this medium of preaching that the world comes to know truth. And if you were to look at the four sermons in the book of Acts, four of them, and look at the common elements, let me tell you what they are. All of them say the time has come. Be sensitive to God's timing. All of them say that. The Kairos time has come. The second thing they say is everything about the gospel is based on the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And the third thing all those sermons say is the prophet said it would happen and it did. This is fulfillment of God's plan. And the fourth thing he says is in all of them Jesus Christ, risen, ascended, is coming again. That's the fourth thing. And the fifth thing in there is, since the Holy Spirit is a real force at work within the body of Christ where we're gathered in His name, and you understand you need Him, you ought to turn your life around and repent. 
That's what the preaching is all about. Um, a great preacher said to a great actor, how is it that when you're on stage, multitudes come to watch and hear you? And I preach to empty pews. And the actor said this, he said, maybe it is because I take fiction and present it in a way that people embrace it as truth. Maybe you take truth and present it in a way as to make people think it's fiction. It might be how you do it. And the end result is, it's not about you. And he names it in the 29th verse. He says that we receive deliverance, sanctification, wisdom, and we receive redemption, being set free. He said that's the bottom line. That's what happens in your life. And the church is responsible for communicating that message. And when that happens, what do you think happens? What do you think happens if you can present the idea of the forgiveness of God so that people know that it's pardon? You're set free from your sins and it's personal cure. You're not only set free, you're healed. Does that work? We believe God is faithful to do that. John Calvin said, God set the universe up and it runs on its own. And Albert Einstein said, God does not throw dice with the universe. God is involved in guiding the universe. And the last thing I want to say to you this morning is this. What he says is that the central thing about the church and about the message is, by the way, you see a pulpit is in the center. It's a symbol that the communicated truth of God's word is central to what we do. The cross becomes for us, because we receive that message, it becomes our lifestyle. You're going to sing a hymn in a minute, so I'll cherish the old rugged cross. Why? Why are you going to cherish it? Because you know it is through the cross that God defeated sin. That the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. We're going to sing that and we're going to be happy about it. There's another line in it we may not be quite as happy about. It's reproach. I will gladly bear. It has the side to it that calls for sacrifice. And what that means is two things. You change your focus in life. You change your focus. It's not about me. Change your focus. A large church in Knoxville, Tennessee, growth around it, not really growing. A lot of growth around it. And one Sunday the pastor said this. He just said this about five years ago. He said, we need to change our Family Life Center and call it Community Outreach Center. And it turned the whole church around. It turned it around because people got it. It's great. Enhanced Family Life, we're all about that. We're all about anything you can do to enhance it. But that concept says it moves beyond just us to the community in which we live because it's not about us. A businessman I know went to his pastor and said to him this, you know that class y'all asked me to teach last year? And I said, no, I want to teach it. Pastor said, what changed your mind? He said, well, this week I went to a funeral with somebody I work with. He was 42 years old and he was successful. He had everything going for him. It happened quick. He said, I walked by that casket and I looked in. I did not see a business portfolio. And I realized in that moment something matters more in life than success. 
It changes our focus. And the final thing to remember, the bottom line in the book of 1 Corinthians is we boast in the Lord, we embrace the message of the cross, and as a result, what Paul is trying to say is everybody has a part in God's plan. Everybody has a part in God's plan. That's why he talks about those gifts. That's why he says, hey, don't get hung up on lawsuits. Don't get hung up on so many things. Realize what your gift is. Make love your aim and get on with it. The soap's fables. It's the one about the crow. The crow is in the wilderness and he cannot... There's a jug there that has water in it about two-thirds full and he can't get the beak down in the jug. Tries he might, he can't get there. So what he does is he goes out and he starts gathering pebbles one at a time and dropping them in that jug. You following this? What happens when those pebbles drop down there? The water rises and the crow quenches his thirst. It's sort of like that in the church. The more everybody puts the pebble in, the more we engage in the synergy of doing that, the more the life-changing grace of God rises to the top and enables people to drink from it. I learned a real interesting thing, I'm through, about bees. Mater links the life of the bee has an interesting story in it about when those bees get in there making honey in that hive, it gets hot. And when that happens, they get a signal. And so all these worker bees move outside that little compartment in that hive, and they start fluttering their wings and fanning that honeycomb, fanning that hive. And it, not only does it get cool, all the stale air comes out of it, and the work goes on. God has a place for everyone. And so... We have, meet, we have met February 2014, and we're coming in here next week and worship. And thereafter, we're going to spend a, a period of time making God's place more beautiful. But in the process, it's more than about the building. It's about you. It's about our life together. And now, gracious Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for your love and mercy and grace so undeserved. What appears to the world to be something very foolish. We come to a cross and something happens. Burdens are lifted. Salvation and eternal life come. But more than that, we understand what life's all about. We understand that you want us to grow to be like Jesus, the man for others, and make a difference in the world in which we live. Lord, help us to do that. That we may honor you, and that we may, in every way, exalt your name above all names. In Jesus' name we make this prayer.